Morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Grit Real Estate Income Group uh, FY 2020 results presentation. Uh, you would have seen out this morning was the announcement of the integrated reports, the financial results, and a small accelerated book build. So, you know, on the call today, we'll go through all of those topics. Um, for way of, uh, of, of process, we intend to mute all lines uh, shortly, and uh, except for Bronwyn and Leon, we'll go through 20 minutes of, or 20 to 30 minutes of presentation, and then we'll open up the lines afterwards for Q&A. Um, by way of Q&A, there is a chat function. So if anybody would like to ask questions even during the, uh, the, 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 the talking part, um, please log your, your questions on the chat function or you raise your hand. Um, there's a raise your hand function. If you, if you scroll over your own picture and, and the three dots in the top, there's a raise your hand function. Um, so yeah, either of those, raise your hand to ask questions in the Q&A section or log a question in the chat function. Um, but without further ado, we will hand over to Bronan and Leon to go through the, um, through the results presentation. Bronan. Thanks, Darren, and thanks for joining us today um, with regards to releasing our June 2020 results. Leon and I will be taking you through the presentation today um, and just really reiterating the key components of how the business is performing, what we've been doing over this COVID period, um, and just in some key analytics around really where we see the business going. So just to reiterate, um, and on this particular slide is that um, Brit's investment strategy, which has really stood it in really um, a strong sort of perspective over this period of COVID is strong tenants, strong counterparties, hard currency leases, um, pan-African diversification, which has obviously been key. Um, and really that has been absolutely fundamental what we've seen in the performance of the underlying portfolio to date. Um, what we are now seeing, and Darren, if you can just go through to the next slide, is that um, you know, from a highlights perspective, as you would have seen, we released a detailed note to the market um, for June. We were awaiting sign off um, of our audited accounts. As we've seen as of to date, our auditors, PwC, um, both in the UK and Mauritius have signed off our accounts. Um, and with regards to the sign off of the accounts, obviously the importance of what we had announced to the market around doing the premium step up is one of the next sort of aspects that we're looking at with regards to these accounts. So really not to spend too much time on this slide because I've got some detailed um, analysis going through, but really one of the key highlights has and impacts and, and looking forward assessments has really been the performance of the underlying business during COVID. Um, and this is really a key topic that's been paramount to all investors. And for us, what we've seen is that we've seen a portion of our portfolio really underlying, underlying corporate accommodation, office, light, industrial, being mostly unaffected. And rental collections, which I'll spend a bit more time as we go through, and in, in the first quarter, we've actually seen over 90% of rentals collected. Um, and really, what's been really important is just to adequately focus on um, liquidity, robust headroom, and one of the aspects today is to discuss really around um, our facilities under the working capital review. We were able to extend all facilities through to December 2022. Um, and one of the aspects um, which is underpinned by the accelerated book board you would have seen announced already was around the refinancing of our drive and trading black empowerment transaction. So Darren, if I can ask that, I can actually look at that in a little bit more detail. So just to remind um, the audience and our investors um, around the drive and trading transaction. Um, black empowerment is really important. Empowerment transformation is really important to the Brit business. It really underpins our fundamental around um, social responsibility in the market. And historically, um, we had a black empowerment vehicle invest in Grit. Um, and the underlying transaction was um, fun funded by BAML at the time, Bank of America, um, and was underpinned with a guarantee from both PRC and ourselves. What's happened is that that facility has expired. Um, PRC has now stood in the shoes of BAML. And what's happened is that under the renegotiation of that facility, and you'll see on the right um, of this particular side, we are in the process of renegotiating that facility, um, but we haven't quite got there yet. And we're not quite comfortable with the terms as yet. So that's currently under discussion. But under the current ambience is the fact that there is a four-day ability for PRC to call us upon our um, aspect of the guarantee, which 
creates a sort of liquidity um, uh, sort of gap of around $10 million. Um, and in order to ensure the success of signing off a um, clean audit report, ensuring that the success of having an underlying um, liquidity facility to back that guarantee, um, we underwent an accelerated book build. Um, and that has been um, really, really positive in relation to seeing the shareholder support. So even though we had made the commitment historically not to issue um, shares below NAV, what was important under here was to create the liquidity headroom, um, as well as what was important is to ensure that we adequately signed off the liquidity in relation to our audit, because that becomes as important for our standard to premium step up. So that is really just giving you a, a little bit of detail around the drive and trade and guarantee exposure and what has been the rationale around the accelerated book build. Just some really big impacts. And um, as I've always said, you know, the team at Brits who's ordinarily used to dealing with Africa and the complexities of Africa outside of South Africa, we really has, have undergone quite a um, huge assessment of the business and really around looking at the business in relation to the impact and where we see the business going forward. And what we've achieved are really these key aspects. So yes, we've seen a 19% decline in the EPRONAV, but that's really been driven around valuations themselves um, and some forex movement, but predominantly valuations around the retail and hospitality sector, which we have seen has been a world pandemic in relation to the impact of those particular asset classes. But what you'll see is that what we have seen success with is that um, even though we haven't um, paid a second half distribution, we expect that to be um, fully to resume in the, in the um, FY 2021. Um, and what we've really looked at as a team is really around cost optimization. Um, we've seen really, really good operational management from our teams on the ground. Um, and really successful over around 90%, as I've mentioned earlier, of cash collections. <coughs> Being able to lift um, covenants um, from 53% to 55%, our multi bank approach, which Leon will go into a bit more detail now, um, and the banks have really stood by us in relation to just making sure that the balance sheet is more resilient for the future. And that's really one of the key aspects of a grit really built to last in a grit future is really making sure the balance sheet is resilient. So other things that we have obviously succeeded this year and have achieved is the successful listing of the JSC, which again goes to cost optimization and really just making sure that the liquidity is driven between two exchanges. So that's been really key. Um, and really now the other aspect around balance sheet optimization is LTV. Um, and as you see, the LTV, which sits just over 50%, has been impacted predominantly by the revaluations of retail and hospitality. What we do see is a near-term focus getting that closer to 45%. Um, and that's driven by asset recycling. We've really achieved that with two assets this year um, and have successfully closed the last disposal for the year with, with the Acacia um, disposal, partial disposal. Um, we have closely negotiated in the final stages of finalizing some new equity instruments um, that are coming into the business, which is really around um, new forms of capital that are able to come in with dropping that LTV um, and really just um, evaluation recovery, what we see. So you'll see some of the markets. And when I go into the slide to show you some of the markets, um, you'll see the impact of how some of the countries, and thanks, Darren, this is the particular slide, is that some of the countries have really not gone into lockdown as maybe you would have seen in Europe and the UK and even South Africa and Mauritius itself. So countries really like Kenya, Ghana, Mozambique um, have really had business as usual. They've gone into a very, very reduced type lockdown. And those type of sectors that sit there under the grid portfolio, which is light industrial office corporate accommodation, has proven to be extremely resilient. Um, so what we've seen is that multi-diverse geographical footprint been really resilient to, yes, macroeconomic changes, but yes, what we've seen in COVID. Now, this is obviously an important slide because this is really what the crux of our operational team has been doing, and that's making sure that we are collecting cash in the bank. And as you'll see, that offices, offices corporate accommodation, light industrial, um, the cash collections have been really, really good. Um, and the impact has been seen on retail and hospitality. Um, and just to spend a little bit of time around hospitality, you would know that our predominantly our hospitality sector exposures in Mauritius itself, um, that is predominantly Lux um, and Beachcomber. 
um, that those particular counterparties have received significant support, specifically Lux from um, the Mauritian government. And we've seen rental payments actually resuming um, post the COVID landlord legislation that was until August of this year. So we actually seen deferred rental being collected again. So that is really, really positive. And it goes to the underlying strength that yes, is an impact, but it's the underlying strength of the tenants. So really around, you know, our key property metrics, obviously cash collections is fundamental. You'll see that our vacancy, our EPRA vacancy would have has just moved from just under 3% to just over 5.5%. And that's really not just been predominantly driven by the actual vacancies of the portfolio, but have been pred predominantly driven by, um, we've taken on new deals, which have actually created the vacancies, which is a partial of the LR portfolio. Um, and we have obviously seen that predominantly around retail. So um, there are specific tenants um, or specific assets, and this particular slide shows it quite well, that you see our predominant vacancy is driven by and for itself, which we saw a vacancy go from 11% to just over 21%, and we've seen that actually dropping post year end, and Makuba Moore itself. And that really just goes to the movement or what we're seeing on lease renewals happening in the market. So um, that has really been seen in the retail. And Brit's strategy, as you know, is to one, disinvest out of retail, and we have partially been successful with that with ANFA, but also not to have any retail pipeline going into the future. So, and But we are happy and continue managing the retail, which is more convenience-driven in the portfolio today. So just um, if we can, if I can hand over to Leon now, really around the financial review, um, and he can take you through the underlying numbers that we've presented to the market. Hi, everyone. Um, just one point to highlight on this page without going through all the stats, uh, just your EPRA adjusted earnings, which is quite an important number for us. Um, you'll see there a decline of 9.1%. That has been predicated by the last quarter of this financial year where we had government and full shutdowns and concessions which we provided to the tenants. Um, I think the long-term aspects of, of keeping these tenants supported is very important for our business. Um, you'll also see that the, the, the distributable earnings dropped 21%, and that's on the back of the, the rental deferments which we had in that last quarter as well. Just moving on to, to the NAV bridge, uh, just to get a, a better understanding of the, the movement from the 147 to the, the 118 EPRA NAV, um, particularly impacted by the, the fair value adjustments to the retail assets. Um, 15.9 cents being impacted there. On the hospitality, 3.7 cents. Um, and then just on the fair values of the, the financial assets, as well as the, the forex movements, an additional 9.1 cents and 3.4 cents. Important in, in our business is obviously the, the cost of debt, as well as the asset base. You'll see that our asset base in total income producing assets stayed relatively flat at 825 to, to 823. However, this was a combination of the acquisitions which we did during the year being club made and the redevelopment of uh, ENFA, as well as the, the additional units that we built on the VDE estate. So the total income producing assets stayed relatively the same. Your loan to value increased 43% to 50.2%. And on that combination, also the cost of funding dropped from 6.4% to 5.9%. Just important to note in terms of the revenue, um, going from 43.6% uh, million last year to 48% on the back of these uh, additional acquisitions, as well as the escalations, which came through during the year of around about 3%. And still some positive uh, interest cover at 2.3, slightly down from the 2.6 on the back of the concessions provided. Just in terms of the debt, at year end we had current facilities for the, the next year of 50 million. We've been able to refinance most of those debts, uh, 42 million out of that being refinanced into to future periods. This is in line with our debt strategy. Um, just the other very important aspect is just the multi-banked approach, as Bronwyn alluded to earlier. Um, we have continually been in discussions with the, the financiers and a special thanks to, to our financiers for being so engaging with us, understanding the business and looking at the various scenarios that we've run and how to actually counteract the, those potential risks. Um, I think just a, a big shout out to, to Standard Bank as well, who have been particularly engaging with us during this period as our biggest financier. Uh, just in terms of the, the actual earnings, and the distributable earnings for the, the last part of the year was 4.33 cents, 
which represents the amount that we've withheld in terms of dividends for this financial year. Um, just important to note that that figure is, is still quite positive and, and still produces a very good dividend yield based on our share price at the moment. Back to Robert. Thanks, Leon. So just to go to the growth and pipeline, because obviously that had been something that we'd been put into the market sort of pre-COVID. So as I've mentioned earlier, I think what is very important to us is really around um, securing the balance sheet. So, you know, all the recycling of assets um, and the initiatives we're doing will be driven um, to reduce um, LTV. But just to reiterate that um, Brit finds itself in a fortunate position that it is really anchored into most of the countries of investment to date, um, which is about eight countries. And healthcare has become a very topical asset class. Um, and we've been su um, successful with our partner to secure two healthcare um, operations and well, developments um, with a very good operator um, in Mauritius. And we look forward to um, concluding on these transactions because it brings a fresh set of um, equity that comes into the business around the DFIs. So these two particular healthcare projects we're really excited about. So um, th there is still obviously, um, the guys are still working predominantly on this. We've got some existing redevelopment which is the Bolleray facility um, in the portfolio, which is obviously redevelopment of warehousing. Warehousing, light industrial is a very exciting asset class for ourselves and will continue to be in the future. A redevelopment with Club Med um, once the hospitality sector settles down. And we've got another urban logistics um, site that we're working on in Kenya. So really the team is focused on this. It will be um, still really paramount to close some of these transactions, but for us, the key focus now is balance sheet strength and getting this LTV and just seeing a recovery around the valuations that we see in the portfolio. So really for us, I mean, I think from our side, being an Africa business, um, being the business which we are today, the growth that we've seen, um, the countries that we invest in, sort of sustainable um, priorities are absolutely fundamental to our business. Um, and we're seeing that in new projects that we're embarking on around sort of different sectors and building efficiency, Obviously, gender equality is something close to my heart. Um, and what we're seeing is that Grit has been able to lead the way. Um, and even in relation to a lot of the um, listed companies in Mauritius and even in the UK itself. So these sustainable priorities are absolutely fundamental for us. Um, and even in the midst of a really difficult year for most, um, we were still very successful um, in relation to certain awards that we achieved. And again, being awarded the PwC corporate reporting awards and we were, it was the first time we had been admitted, really goes to what we had driven from a governance perspective um, with regards to the premium step up and really led by Moira and the team. It's been amazing to see a, a seamless approach to the governance and the reporting side. So really just to um, end on really around the key fundamentals of the grid business and really what we're going to be focusing on as a management um, team and Definitively, we haven't gone to sleep this year. If anything, um, we have, we've become even more efficient than before, but really around the retail sector, as I've mentioned in the presentation, we've seen the impact on valuations. We continue to see the impact on the retail cycle in many countries, not just Africa, the African continent. So we will continue to reduce our retail exposure. Um, really the operational team in the midst of not necessarily always being able to get to these projects and sites um, because of lockdown, have done a phenomenal job and we really are ahead of our peers around collective um, rental collections and, and management of assets, really sweating those asset classes. Um, and really around um, the, the investment strategy is really going to be focused around what we've seen to be resilient asset classes and actually what makes up our pipeline today anyway. And then balance sheets, balance sheet, balance sheets. I mean, I think that is absolutely paramount. So um, valuation recovery, getting the LTV closer to the 45%, um, the, just the temporary suspension of one half of the year dis um, distribution, um, the reiteration that we are expecting that will resume in 2021, the cash flow exists in the business today, we are collecting it. And then the capital structure, which has gone a long way and we've journeyed a long, long time to find the optimal capital structure for the business. So that is really driven around having London, um, which is the will be the primary listing, Mauritius the secondary, and then being able to successfully get that premium step up done. And we're hoping that we'll be able to still achieve that this year, 
which will give us um, access into the main indexes in, in the UK, which is very important for liquidity and many other aspects. The redomicilian into Guernsey is also really key for us. Um, and that all goes in line with this, being able to do this um, premium step up and also access into the main FTSE. So really on, on behalf of myself and the board, um, it has been a year like no other. Um, I do believe we have come out stronger. Um, I do believe that we have come out focused. Um, we, have, we have contextualized the concept of reinvention revolution at the business. Um, and the, term, the team has really worked very, very hard um, to really produce a set of results and end up with a, a very, very good order report and order finding. And with regards to working with both our sponsors in the UK, FinCap and Deloitte, and working with our reporting accountants, PwC. So on behalf of myself and the team and the board, I'd like to thank you for listening today. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, right, so we'll now go across to questions. Um, as described, I think that one of the easier ways is to you know, raise your hand is, is one of the, uh, the three buttons on the top of your screen. You should see a raise your hand uh, function. Uh, alternatively, please feel free to um, drop any questions into the chat room and we can answer them that way. So yeah, across uh, to opening up questions, um, please log those now if you'd like. And I suppose we have to uh, caveat that by saying this is the first time we're trying this as a technology platform. So uh, if it runs slightly inefficiently, you'll have to excuse us as we, as we go through the, the teething problems. But uh, you know, hopefully we can go straight to, to questions now. Um, right, I think we've got Roy Campbell. Um, you can unmute yourself, Roy. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, with the um, changes um, during the year to the Mauritian ability to help the hospitality sector pay their sort of landlord bills, etc., have you noticed any shift in the valuer's attitude to NAVs? Or is it too early uh, for them to alter that uh, with something sort of so unique as the Mauritian ability where the, you're, you're getting paid? Uh, um, and I'm chuckling, Roy, because it's actually a very good question because um, valuations have obviously really been a very topical discussion. Um, and, and just a reminder to our audience that as a London list of business, we have to have every asset independently valued, and that's predominantly driven by Knight Frank in the UK. But we've seen even the auditors take a, a very um, uh, interesting view on valuations and just what we're seeing around the terror and uncertainty. But I think, Roy, definitively, um, we do as management see an opportunity with the likes of the funding that's coming out of government to these particular hospitality groups really improve those valuations around, one, again, material uncertainty because there is underlying cash flow that's underpinning these lockdowns. Um, and obviously, with that material uncertainty removed, we should see an impact on, on, on yields and cap rates. So, and you know, definitively, we haven't we, we haven't seen it today, um, and this sort of government support has been quite recent through to these hospitality groups. But we do see the mindset um, of what we, we're going to be going from a valuations perspective with these with these valuers. So there is positive to come out of it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Bronwyn. We have a question: um, Can we comment on the operating cash flows in the year end FY20, and I presume also FY21, the outlook for operating cash flows? So, um, yeah, I don't know if Leon wants to take a stab at that, and we can probably go back to um, the cash collection slide as a starting point, and then maybe comment how that filters through to your operating um, cash flows, Leon. Sure. So. At the, the moment, the, the cash collections are sitting around about the 90% mark um, with still some retail uh, concessions coming through the, the period now for the last few months, although far reduced from what we had in the, the last quarter of the financial year. Um, I think it, it would be naive to assume that it was going to improve uh, much past that, but we, we do believe that the, the current collection ratio is sustainable um, into the, the FY21 financial year which obviously is a positive impact to being able to pay to pay distribution. Um, and I think that's, that's obviously why, why we are driving the operational management and the cash flow collections, um, because we're very aware that we want to get into a position where we start paying our distribution again. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I think the next question, can you give us an indication of the magnitude of the write downs in the worst affected assets? Um, and then I suppose also what the outlook is as we return back to normal um, yeah, post COVID. So uh, maybe this is a good place to start on this slide, John. Or, 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 or. I think just in terms of the, the write downs, I mean, the, the most impacted asset was um, unfortunately Anfer has just been through a redevelopment where we saw over 20% on that specific asset. The, the class that was mostly impacted was retail. Um, the, the hospitality wasn't as impacted because of the, the government funding that has been put in place by the, the Mauritian government specifically. Um, so that that impact is, is going to be felt over a period of time where we just need to ensure that the, the strength of the actual underlying tenants. Uh, just a reminder that you know, we don't face any direct operational cost pressures on our uh, hospitality assets. Um, so it really comes down to the strength of the counterparty and their ability to service that rental going into the future in terms of the valuations. Um, I think there, there's probably a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction in terms of the, the COVID impact on the other assets and um, with slight increases in, in discount rate and cap rates by the valuers and um, just to be more on the cautious side, which I suppose is quite prudent um, and we'll continue to monitor that. I think as we start seeing the, the impact of the vaccine coming through um, specifically on the hospitality assets in, in the next sort of six to 12 months, we'll see positive impacts coming into that, that structure. Yeah, I think just maybe just finishing on that point, I think, as Leon said, sort of office, office um, light industrial and corporate accommodation was a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction and really around material uncertainty. Now that these assets have lived lockdown and lived through the period um, or, or lack thereof, or the valuers have now seen how these markets have behaved to lockdown countries like Mozambique, we do see, and, and we've been in discussions, we do see that those assets will come back. Um, and obviously on the hospitality side, predominantly driven by, by Lux and Beachcomber, very strong counterparties, um, very integral to the, to the success and the importance of obviously Mauritius itself. So, you know, we will see what's to come. And there's obviously a lot of positive news coming out of, of, of vac vaccines and that. But be that as it may, even without that, um, we do see some of the stabilizing and are not too much more of an impact uh, on, on a devaluation perspective. Um, Bronwyn, maybe just overlay structural trends because clearly we see retail being affected globally. Um, office in Europe is is being affected differently um, to how we're experiencing Africa. Uh, maybe just comment on, on how, and obviously it's not definitive, but what we're seeing on the ground and, and potentially how different sectors operate and, and are expected to operate post COVID. Yeah, so it's been an interesting one because obviously we overlay sort of more developed world thinking, especially when it comes to valuers and, and auditors. And the discussion is that office, what you see in office in Africa versus what you see in developed markets is actually very different. Um, especially around our more specialist type offices to corporate tenants like Anadarko and these guys, you know, the infrastructure doesn't exist from work, work from home. You know, everything's been built for specification wise for these particular tenants and these staff within these assets. So we actually saw guys staying at home for a very short period of time and wanting access back into the offices quite quickly. And it's more around putting sanitary controls and all of that, which actually the team has been very successful on the operational side. So, the trend that you're seeing in offices and developed markets where guys are reducing office space, um, work from home, is not the same cycle that you're seeing in Africa and these particular, um, uh, the, these particular countries themselves. So we really are not seeing the same trends in relation to that. So that's also a, quite a bit of a differential than what you see coming out of other, other types of markets. Thank you. Um, next question. So talking about that pipeline, um, can you talk about whether you'll require further funding or, or how you'll fund that further pipeline that we've discussed? So, yeah, one of the things that we have worked on this year um, is really looking at other forms of capital. And, and obviously, we're cognizant of the LTV, so it's other forms of equity in the, into the business. So um, we've done a lot of work over the years with the DFIs. Um, and I've mentioned specifically the healthcare assets um, that we've identified. Um, and DFIs are really keen to fund these social type assets. Um, so for us, the, should we actually look at um, concluding the pipeline, you know, we would not do it from fresh equity raise because of where we're sitting at a discount now. The big thing is to get the share price to re-rate off the back of the capital structure, re resuming dividends, um, moving forward. But the intention would be to use 
other types of instruments. Um, and obviously those other types of instruments still need to be accretive to the transaction. So the deals that we're working on today are actually very accretive transactions. We've even been able to renegotiate those because of where we find ourselves. So that type of preference money that's coming in from DFI type entities, we will be able to use. Obviously, as I mentioned, balance sheets and being able to get the LTV down to 45% is, is critical, but the delivery of the pipeline will be done with those, those different types of instruments and acid recycling. So as we mentioned earlier, we have disposed of partial disposals of two assets this year. We do have a few more assets that we're looking at in the new part of um, uh, the year coming up in 2021. So that cash that we bring into the business will be cash that we recycle into these various projects and initiatives. Great, thank you. We have a few more questions on the chat, but I think before we do that, let's go to um, Bavik, uh, who has a hand up. Um, so please fire away. You can unmute your line and, uh, and uh, ask your question, Bavik. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Bronwyn and Leon. Uh, thanks for the call. Um, a quick question I had uh, was basically, um, uh, the first one is, you know, have... Uh, in the independent valuation process, have all your assets been completely sweated out in the sense that can we expect any more impairments or as we are, you know, taking all the worst case scenarios already in there, have all those already been taken into account? And in that sense, can we no longer expect, can we expect that, that we won't be seeing further impairments in the future? Uh, that's the first question I had. And the second question I had was on the LTV. You talked about how you want to get that lower. Uh, if you could just give us a bit more details on how you plan on doing those. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks. Um, thanks, Bavik. And normally we would see you in person, so sorry about that. So I think from our side, um, just on the on the valuations, um, you know, we obviously need to take um, sort of where we're sitting in the market now. And, you know, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty, as we're all aware, um, around what's going on in the market. And, and it's not just necessarily uncertainty that drives um, uncertainty in our portfolio, it's macroeconomic uncertainty, which drives valuers thinking. So, you know, we'd like to believe that we are at the lower end of these valuation cycles. As we mentioned um, in this particular slide, if you look at office, corporate accommodation, light industrial, you know, like for like, we should actually start seeing that growing again. Um, and, you know, working with the valuers now to take out the concept of material uncertainty, to, to understand the concept of the longer term leases, um, and really just around working with us around valuation. So, however, as we know, Mauritius still hasn't opened its borders. So it's, it's very difficult for, for me to sort of definitively say that, you know, hospitality in Mauritius is going to recover X, Y, Z, because there is still no line of sight of that. Yes, these guys have received um, and are receiving government funding, which is obviously going to assist, and that does assist the valuers. Yes, they strong counterparties. Um, but that type of impairment, obviously, we need to look at what happens in the market. So as much as we as management are working closely with the valuers and making sure that the leases are renewed and longer term leases are signed and all of those things that impact um, sort of cap rate and discount rate, we're still living in the, in the world of COVID. Um, and we're at very early stages of vaccinations, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as we see it, as we stand today, we are hoping that we won't see too much more material uncertainty around or any further devaluation of those assets as we sit in the portfolio. On the loan to value specifically, how the, the sort of bridge will happen from the 50 to, 50, uh, to 45%, if you look at the right of the slide, we've got opportunities on disposing some of the, our assets. Um, we have already successfully closed two of those um, caches in the door effectively, so we've already seen a drop in the LTV. Um, I mentioned those equity and pref notes. Um, we are in the, in, the, in the final stages of finalizing those type of instruments, which will bring in equity into the business, which is not traditional equity sort of raising um, off our shares, but bringing in pref notes, which obviously will drop the loan to value. The euro move has also played havoc um, in relation because remember we have euro assets that sit in some of our hospitality. So sort of the recovery of that, we see a positive impact um, and then obviously we want to deliver some of these accretive acquisitions um, uh, and pipeline. And then as I've mentioned to you at the beginning of this is that we should see some valuation recovery coming into sort of half year now and the full year June 2021. So we have a very clear, very definitive trajectory of how to get that LTV 
in the near term um, around 45%. Ronan, maybe just to link up uh, another question that's come through, um, you know, given some of the uncertainties um, around the pandemic, is 45% in the near term still too high? Um, and I suppose uh, linking into that, I suppose the question really asks is our commitment towards our medium term target, does that still exist? And you know, to what extent do we still see that coming down over time? So for us, the near-term um, focus and in, in, in near-term analysis of 45 is actually stuff that we can actually touch and feel, which sounds a bit strange, but it's valuation recovery, and you would have seen uh, that's right at the bottom, and it's to be confirmed. Valuation recovery for me sits more in the medium-term target. So what we, can, what we know and what we understand and what we can see today is really around the ability on the asset recycling, the pref notes that are coming in, the euro move, and, and some of the accretive acquisitions. So that's the stuff that we are that have in our control. Um, that is saying that provided that these valuations don't blow out any further, but we're quite confident that, that there was a very prudent conservative approach taken for June. And actually, um, we were prejudiced on global economic um, retail, uh, not retail or even retail, but um, real estate movement, when in fact that if you sat in countries like Mozambique and Ghana, it wasn't going on the same basis. Um, and it's quite, a, it's quite a difficult thing to actually, you know, say that, you know, offices are not seeing as much an impact as you've got offices in the UK, but that is the reality of what we've seen on the ground. So the impact that we saw in June, we think and believe was a very conservative approach applied by our valuers. And again, they're really sort of saying to us that they're quite comfortable in some regions to lift the material uncertainty that they actually put into some of the valuation reports that they did, which is really, really positive. So for me, you know, the team and ourselves are quite confident around getting it quite close to the 45. Yes, the 35 to 40, um, you know, that medium term, how long is a piece of string? But, you know, ultimately we should see some valuation recovery coming and again, you know, we might be sitting here this time next year and the entire world is vaccinated and this will be a very different discussion. Um, however, that does sit in that medium term and that is a discussion we'll need to have a look at in a year's time. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Um, okay, so a couple more questions coming through pertain right back to the hospitality sector and the outlook. Um, so a number of questions which will sort of package all into one. But maybe I think as a starting point, Bronan and Leon, you can maybe re-describe the lease structure. I know we've discussed it already, but I think the question is coming through. Just quickly address the lease structure we have with uh, our tenants, the government support that they're getting and the duration that that is expected to last. And then any any data point you can give us on current bookings um, through through either Lux or, or Beachcomber's assets. So to give a sense of you know what are, what are, what working capital do they have, and to what extent what are we seeing in in bookings currently, albeit the Mauritian borders remain relatively uh, controlled right now. So I'll pick up on that. Leon can actually he, I'll, I'll let him go to the government support. So I think. Um, you know, just to really just sum up quickly. So from a lease perspective, um, we don't take hospitality risks. So it is a triple net lease. Um, we basically rent out the bricks and mortar through to both Lux and Beachcomber. It's a long-term lease, um, sort of 12 to, I think 12 to 15 years, the two leases. Um, it's underpinned by, by their parent groups. So really from a lease perspective, um, we have... Um, the, we have every opportunity to enforce our, our rights under the lease. So that's really, really important. Furthermore, the Mauritian government um, was really um, around landlord relationships, landlords and tenants came out um, and the concept of force majeure, um, you know, was firstly is not included in our lease agreement, so they didn't have the ability to call that. But the government came out and said, okay, from the period of effectively April to August, um, you will not get a rental remission. Um, or a concession, you'll get a basically a cash flow reprieve, which meant that we, from a cash flow perspective, had to support these tenants, um, but they still have to fully pay that um, by the by December next year. So there's no rental holiday. So underlying rentals weren't impacted. However, from a cash flow perspective, we've obviously needed to make sure that we manage and assist these guys from a cash flow perspective. So. One is that they've both started resuming rental payments um, from the 1st of August, um, 
what's really important around that is then the underlying cash flow and cash flow performance, which maybe Leon, you can just pick up around the support they've received on wages, et cetera, et cetera. So the Mauritian government has been very proactive with the, the hospitality sector. Um, they have got a wage subsidy scheme, which is assisting them paying the wages of their, their lower paid workers. Um, they have given them um, the ability to not pay their land rentals. Um, as you know, most of the beachfront property in Mauritius is owned by the government and leased to, to these hotel operators. It's for a minimum period of 12 months. And then under the auspices of the Bank of Mauritius, there's a, a funding scheme called the, the Mauritius in, uh, Investment Company. Um, Lux have actually put out an announcement in terms of them being successful in their application and that is going for a shareholder approval at the end of this month, which will really underpin their cash flows going forward. I think just in terms of the actual operations of the hotels, um, a number of the hotels are actually acting as quarantine facilities at the moment, um, where they, they are occupied for two weeks by all returning residents and, and people that are coming into Mauritius on long-term stays, which is actually filling up the hotels, not at the, the premium uh, rates that they could have achieved if they were operating, but they're still of sustainable rates. Um, and then just through the local market, some of the hotels have been open to, to specifically cater for the local residents in Mauritius. I mean, there's 1.3 million people in Mauritius and you're seeing exceptional bookings specifically on the weekends um, in the likes of the, the Cannonier Hotel, which is operated by Beachcomber, as well as the Tomas Hotel operated by Lex. Uh, to actually get a booking in these hotels on weekends is extremely difficult. And actually, interesting enough, Tomasa has opened up for a four-week period over December and is 100% occupied, to just give you an indication of, of the local support that these hotels are receiving. So I think it's, it's not a long-term sustainable structure in, in terms of this, but it can certainly get us through the, the worst of COVID until the borders are open. Um, it's difficult to get forward bookings at the moment until there's a clear line of sight of opening the borders. Um, and I think that will, will remain one of the, the reasons why the MRC funding is so important to these operators. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, linking back to indexation in rents. Um, so obviously we've disclosed today a weighted average indexation of 2.9% across the portfolio. Uh, and so obviously revenue should grow by that in the coming year, given the long-term nature of those lease structures. I think the question is, are we still seeing those? Are we getting any pushbacks on current terms or pressures on, on, on contract renewals? Um, and I suppose a good starting point will be to once again show the long-term nature of the, uh, of, of the income streams, but maybe comment on the indexation across those, uh, those income streams. So a lot of the, the actual indexations are linked to, to CPI. Um, and then there are CPI plus a margin, which is, is really bringing us to the, the two and a half to, to 3%. Um, we haven't seen much pushback in terms of escalations. Um, I think where we are seeing a little bit of pressure is the actual ability to fill the vacancies, uh, which specifically in the retail sector, we, we're seeing people with a wait and see attitude um, in terms of taking up the vacancies. We, we still have a lot of interest in that, um, those vacant spaces being taken up. But I think there's also pressure from the actual retailers to look for a, a better deal. And it's a bit of a, a market for the tenants rather than the landlords at this stage, which is it's going to put a little bit of pressure on some of those lease rates. We don't have an enormous amount of, of vacancies other than in Anfa. So it's just managing that process where you, you can't look at anything in isolation. You have to really do a deep analysis of whether you, you actually take on some of these leases at, at lower rates for an interim period um, or provide rental concessions or a uh, sweetened deal for six to 12 months in terms of getting these, these vacancies filled. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? We don't seem to have any more in the chat rooms. Um, anybody else want to raise a hand for a question? Um, apparently I've missed one, sorry. Um, yeah, I suppose it links back into the hospitality. I suppose, um, you know, do we see any long-term changes in hospitality assets? Um, you know, obviously airline traffic might change and a lot of airlines are seeing stress and pressure points on their own uh, operations. You know, do we think that there are going to be any structural changes across the hospitality assets and you know, how much visibility do we really have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think from our side, again, 
um, is really, you know, I, I, I do think from a from a world perspective and other markets, you know, I think there's a there's and, and, and different types of hospitality because you get a range of hospitality. I mean, obviously ours is more leisure type hospitality. You know, you possibly will start and not possibly, you definitively will start seeing a restructuring of, of hospitality. However, our particular three groups that we, we work with, um, obviously Club Med being one of them, um, Beachcoma and Lux, yes, um, they obviously going to have to be looking at repositioning themselves. And even Mauritius as an island is going to have to look at repositioning itself. But, you know, they are they're still very strong leisure um, operators. And these hotels have always serviced your, they're more four-star type, fully inclusive, more affordable type hospitality. Um, and, you know, it was one of the things that we had said up front is that why we don't invest in five-star luxury type hospitality, because just from a, an occupancy perspective, you know, all of those, the numbers are, are very, very tight. So for us, you know, on our assets, as they said today, um, you know, it is going to be quite difficult from a cash flow perspective. And these guys just ensuring that they can sort of continue to make sure they can meet obligations. But fundamentally, that four-star fully inclusive really is will, will, will exist into the future. Um, so, you know, are we rushing out and doing more hospitality deals now and looking at pipeline? No. Are there opportunities? Definitively, yes. Um, but we also want to see how it pans out because I don't think any of us can have a definitive answer to this particular question. But again, we're comfortable with the groups. Um, and, and, and I've always said, you know, while we're multi-asset class, is because we we after the tenant and the strength of the tenant and that the tenant knows what they're doing more than anything else than necessarily the asset class itself. So, and I reiterate that 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 point. Thank you, um, Bronwyn. There aren't any further questions, but maybe I can throw one at you um, to just maybe talk. We've mentioned at very high level about the about the structure of our of our share register um, and some some of the corporate action we've done around the listing locations. Um, there is an AGM uh, meeting, I think it's the 28th of December, seeking authority for the redomicile um, to Guernsey. But maybe you can just, again, summarize for us the path we're walking um, in terms of the listing structure and, and, and how we and where we expect it to end up. Yeah, so um, as I've said, the, the capital structure at GRIT has been interesting. Um, you know, we have a very unique business model um, for the markets and where we find ourselves. So being adequately sort of um, supported from an institutional perspective is really key for us. And really the evolution of that for us um, has been the fact that we see our main listing sitting on the London Stock Exchange. Um, what's very important for from that perspective is that we listed um, in July 2018 with a standard listing. We want to be sitting as an Africa business as a premium listed stock. That doesn't just necessarily go to ensuring index inclusion, but also ensuring um, you know, investors are comfortable around the governance of an Africa business. So really where we've seen ourselves is that we historically had three listings, JSC, London, and Mauritius. We successfully delisted off the JSC. We brought in two really good strategic long-term shareholders in Zepri and Botswana Development Corp. Um, with that, we have now got the primary listing in London and secondary in Mauritius, and we will continue to keep that capital structure. Where we are going to now is we would like to do the step up to a premium listing in the UK, and the REIT domicilian goes hand in hand with assisting and making sure from a capital structure perspective that we are able to um, get uh, all share and main FTSE inclusion in London. So what we have seen, which is really key, um, and Darren, who you hear speaking now, has been really key member of the team. We've seen the share register in the UK to track close just over 31%. Um, we've seen great institutional support out of um, UK institutional holders. Uh, we've seen very good support out of insurance companies and pension funds in Africa as we continue to drive very, very good distribution, distribution targets. So really that is the, um, the capital structure where we see the business going forward. And um, we're hoping to have that all concluded in the up and coming weeks, which would be um, the redomicilian into Guernsey and also the premium step up um, from a standard listing, which will really stand us in good stead for the, for the new year to really have a very, very strong capital structure and investor following. Um, maybe so just Brandon, to follow on the... Clarify the 
sorry, just to sorry. add, can, can you me? clarify our um, Mauritian intentions? And, and, you know, I think in the announcement, we, we've mentioned that we remain fully operational in Mauritius. So maybe just expand a little bit about our commitment to Mauritius, please. Yeah, so I think, um, as some of you might know, we picked up the business around five years ago um, and moved probably about 26 families at that stage to Mauritius. We have now got a staff complement of over 80 people out of Mauritius and been, have been very successful um, around creating a very good domicile in here. Being, we've been able to um, source highly skilled um, persons, including Mauritians from all over the world. Um, we have um, been supported by the local Mauritian banks. State Bank of Mauritius has been our largest funder in, in, in Mauritius itself. Um, we've also been um, really supported by institutional guys. National Pension Fund of Mauritius is a large shareholder of GRIT. So, you know, the intention is to keep operationally strong in Mauritius. Um, and we have got a very, very strong commitment. We've shown strong commitment to Mauritius in the last five years. Um, as I've always said, and you might hear me say, we haven't used Mauritius as a post box. Um, and we are one of the few foreign businesses that have really created a proper domicile in here. So we, um, we remain extremely committed to, to Mauritius itself. I know Leon wanted to add something. That's exactly Oh, right. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. You all think alike. Thank you. Darren, are there any other questions? Great, sorry, I was struggling with technology once again. Um, great, so I, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Um, I think we'll conclude the presentation on that basis. Uh, uh, thank you everybody for attending today. If there are any further follow-up questions, um, please feel free to email ir at grit.group or reach out directly to either myself, Ron or Leon. Um, we should have the conclusion of the accelerated book build sort of in the next, within the next 24 hours. Um, and obviously that sets up really well for a hopefully successful 2021 and hopefully a recovering global 2021. So for that, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Brandon and Leon for an informative uh, uh, presentation and we'll now end the call. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.